And we got a lot to cover, a lot of ground that I want to cover today. Hopefully I'll be able to get this across to you the way it is in my heart for you today, uh, because I want to talk about happiness today. I want to talk about, you know, what I've learned is um, happiness is not different than joy. In fact, the Oxford Dictionary simply describes joy in the following way, a feeling of great pleasure and happiness a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. That's what joy is. So joy and happiness. I know that some people get a little overly spiritual about it and they say, well, joy is different than happiness and happiness is based on your circumstances and joy isn't. But really, they're the same thing that that joy is simply a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. I remember um, I don't know, I, I, you know, I don't know what year this was a few. It was several years ago. Uh, and Tiger Woods at that time was the, you know, the greatest golfer uh, in his era and still he's pretty great today. But this is like several years ago. He had won his 70th. I think it was the 70th tournament that he'd won um, in, in his career, 70 golf tournaments uh, as a professional. And they asked him when he had won his 70th and he'd broken somebody's record. He hadn't broken the all time record. He has broken that, but he hadn't at that time. But he'd broken Jack Nicklaus's or some other golfer's record. And they said, what's your feeling about having won your 70th, having won your 70th tournament? What do you feel? And he said two words, pure joy, pure joy, pure joy. And I thought about that when I heard that interview and I thought that's what that's what the gospel brings. The gospel brings pure joy. The gospel will make you happy if you understand it correctly. The what Jesus has done for us will bring pure joy if you understand it correctly. And we're going to make sure that we do. But there's no higher or deeper desire in the heart of mankind than happiness. Happiness is the single most intoxicating emotion. There is nothing more intoxicating than happiness. Even love is intoxicating because it makes you happy. That's what love when love, when the chemicals are released through love, it produces happiness in the brain. It goes to the pleasure center of the brain and it causes you to be happy. A feeling that somebody loves you and a feeling of love for somebody else creates the chemical release of endorphins that actually make a person happy. It hits the there's a there's a place in the brain called the the pleasure center. And it hits the pleasure center of the brain and then it spreads. It affects the whole body and it affects the whole emotion system and the the whole um, skeletal system of the human of the human life. It affects everything because that's how powerful happiness is. And so um, the tragedy, the tragedy in life today is not that man cannot find happiness. The tragedy is that he's searching for it in the wrong places. The tragedy is not that man can't find happiness. The tragedy is that man is searching for it in the wrong places. The great scientist Blaise Pascal said all mankind seeks happiness. All mankind seeks happiness. This is the motive of every action of every man, even those who kill themselves. We think that a person that takes their own life is taking their own life because of the sorrow, but they're really taking their own life because they're searching for happiness. That is truly why they're doing what they do. And obviously, please don't do that. Please don't. Please, if you know anybody who's who's down this season and this time of year, call them, encourage them, let them know that there's a reason for their life and there's a reason for them being on this earth. And God loves them and has a purpose for them, no matter how bad their situation might be. But I'm telling you, folks, that we um, that this is why people do what they do. Why did you why did you go to college? If you went to college, you went so that you could get a career that you would be happy, fulfilling or to or to make an income that you would be happy having or why'd you get married so that you could have happiness in your home. So you married because you thought that person brought you happiness. Then you got divorced because you thought that would bring you happiness. Everything people do is to bring them happiness, even though it's misguided much of the time and we're doing the wrong things. The pursuit is happiness. 
And really, frankly, we know there are enough people that we know of and enough people in the world to, to examine and to, and, to, and to observe this, that that people that have fame, the fame that this world offers, the money that this world offers, the status that this world offers does not satisfy the need for happiness inside of a human being. See, whatever you have, whatever status you are financially, economically, socially, does that does none of that determines your happiness. What determines your happiness is something inside. And we'll talk about that. But I want you to really understand that um, that this is why we do the things we, you didn't come to church today to be sad. You came to church to be happy. Something inside of you tell, told you that there is some some measure of happiness that you would find by being here. If you get up and leave while I'm talking, the only reason you're going to get up and leave while I'm talking is because you think that by leaving somehow that's going to give you happiness. I got news for you. It won't. <laughs> but think about it. Whatever we do is always the reason we do it is ultimately to be happy. And why do people do drugs to be happy, to feel good? Why do people drink excessively to be happy? It, again, I'm not saying those things are the way to find it, but they're the, that is the reason why people are doing that is to find happiness. OK, happiness was God's idea. Happiness is God's idea. It's not the devil's idea. If the devil, if it was the devil's idea to make you happy, then man, we'd have been happy before we met Jesus because the devil had us fully. The devil doesn't want you happy. He wants you miserable. And religion makes people miserable. Man's religion makes people miserable, but God's grace makes them glad. Man's religion makes people miserable, but God's grace makes us glad. Well, you'll see as we continue in this, happiness was not only God's idea. It is part of God's nature. It flows from him. It flows from him. Listen, I got to tell you, um, there is there there. Not only does religion make people miserable, religion, man's efforts to become right with God, man's efforts to be pleasing to God, man's way. That's what's resulted in, you know, hundreds of religions in this world, man pursuing some way to connect with God, but failing at it. Because what religion does is it imprisons people. If I have to do this, this and this in order for God to be happy, if I have to follow this list and avoid this list in order for God to be happy, then I'm going to miserably fail continually because nobody can keep all the lists. And nobody can avoid all the bad lists and nobody can keep all the good lists. And so religion imprisons us. Once we realize we can't keep all the lists, we feel imprisoned to guilt, condemnation or guilt. We feel imprisoned by guilt. We are imprisoned by oppression. We don't feel powerful enough to do anything about our situation. So religion brings it brings guilt, it brings oppression and it brings the fear of what people think. Like so often people make decisions based on what other people think about them. They behave in such a way that's completely based on what other people think about them. And maybe maybe we'll come back to that. But but the gospel frees us from condemnation, frees us from oppression and frees us from the fear of what people think about us. And but the search for happiness is why we do what we do. It's the common ground upon which all human desire and, and all human activity and all human ambitions is surrounded with or is or are the grounds are the, the, the search for happiness are the grounds for all those things. We we do these things, all of our desires, all of our ambitions, all the activity that we do is focused on finding happiness or making somebody happy. But there's nothing we can do and that other people can do to make us happy enough to satisfy us. That's why it's the inside job. Like God does it from the inside out. And we'll talk about that. But think for a moment on the arrival of Jesus. So Jesus comes into the world and he's born in Bethlehem as a baby and watch what happens to everybody that comes in contact with this baby 
Jesus with the baby, the baby in a manger. In Luke chapter two, verse 10, the angel says to the shepherds, now, th now think about this. He says, for fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. Now, let's let's follow this logic here. The angel says about Jesus to the shepherds, I bring you I bring you good news. Oh, by the way, he says, don't be afraid. He's about to give us the cure for fear. He said, don't be afraid. Why? How can I be? How can I get to the place where I'm not afraid by the good news? He said, I bring you good news. You didn't bring it. The angel brought it. God brought it. We don't bring it. He said, I bring you good news of great joy. OK, so now he's saying the emotion you had before the good news was fear. He says, do not be afraid, for I bring you good news, which produces great joy. So he's saying, watch this now. He's saying before you heard the good news, before the angel brings the good news about Jesus, mankind is living in fear. Then we hear the good news about Jesus and look at what it, what happens. The result is great joy. Good news produces great joy. And you can you can you can just test this in your own life. Watch television news for a little while and watch what it will produce. It will produce grief, not joy. All you have to do is listen to people reporting on other people and the bad news that is in this world. Bad news creates a deficit of joy. Good news creates great joy. The good news of Jesus produces great joy. You see, the, our problem is not that we're not listening to the news. Our problem is we're listening to the wrong news. We're getting our information from man's observation of the things that are happening in the world, and we're not looking at it from God's point of view. We need to change our perspective. Yes, man has a point of view. Uh, man's point of view is negative. Man's point of view complains. People say ask all the time. Why don't the reporters in the news? Why doesn't the news industry uh, tell the good stories uh, about great things that are happening in the world? And the reason the answer is because people won't listen because people are looking for bad news. It makes them feel a little better maybe about themselves or it makes them you know, feel like like they're, they're not the only ones suffering. I don't know what the reason is, but mankind is inclined to negativity. And we have to we have to realize that God wants us to re, to, to 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 experience the joy and the happiness that comes from good news. We got to reprogram ourselves by listening to the right information rather than the wrong information. See who you get your news from matters. Well, you know this in, in, in everyday life. You if you listen to liberal based news media outlets, you tend to, you'll have a tendency to think from a liberal's point of view. If you listen to conservative based uh, programming, then you'll have a tendency to lean towards conservative based uh, uh, feelings and, and points of view. So let's put that aside for a moment and let's zero in on the good news of Jesus coming to this earth to save us from our sin. And when we focus on that and when our mind stays on the good news, then our emotions stay in a stream of great joy. When our mind veers away from the good news, then our stream of emotion follows whatever our mind is paying attention to. So if we are continue, if we are allowing a continual stream of good news about what God has done, good news about what Jesus is, good news about the gospel, good news about what the blood of Jesus has done for us, as we have a continual stream of thinking about the good news, we're going to have a continual stream of positive positive emotions, joy and happiness. And there ain't nothing wrong with that. God wants us to be happy. Happiness is his idea. And he's given us the source of all happiness. Listen, how can I put this to you? Go over to Genesis chapter three for a moment. So here, Adam and Eve are in the garden. And we always come back to this for some reason, because this explains it so well. Genesis chapter three. Look at what happens. The serpent enters into the garden in verse one and begins to sow a stream of thinking that is pessimistic, negative, a bad, a, a misconception about God. Has God really said you shall not eat from the tree of the garden? 
And so notice what he says. He's challenging God's nature. He's questioning God. He's getting Adam and Eve to question God, to question God's intention, to question God's motive. And so what is what has the serpent successfully done? He's interrupted the good news with bad news. And therefore, he's interrupted the stream of positive emotions because of a stream or a string of negative thoughts. God is holding out on you. God's lying to you. You shall not die. See, the woman says from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat freely. But if we eat of the tree, of the, if we touch or eat the tree in the middle of the garden, we shall die. And the serpent said, you shall not die. So the serpent completely contradicts what God said. God said, you shall die. So they stayed away from it and they ate from the other trees, most likely. This probably wasn't the first day they were in the garden. They probably in the, who knows? We don't even know how long they're, they're, they've, they've been in the garden since this time. But but they, they could eat freely from any of the other trees. And they knew that God said, don't eat from that one because the day you eat from it, you'll die. He said that in Genesis chapter two. And here in Genesis chapter three, the devil immediately comes to interrupt the positivity that existed in the Garden of Eden. Everything was positive. It's perfect. Everything. Perfect man, perfect woman, perfect garden, perfect weather, perfect plants and just everything's beautiful. The, the Garden of Eden is the word Eden is the word pleasure. It was the Garden of Pleasure. Everything was pleasurable. Everything made Adam and Eve happy. Everything in the garden. Like I know that it sounds it sounds idealistic. And the reason why it sounds that way is because we've been we've been programmed. We've been we've been programmed with negativity most of our lives. And so we constantly assume, well, there, it couldn't be that good. Life couldn't be that good. The gospel can't be that easy. Uh, but Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. But what do preachers say? The Christian life is hard. Yet Jesus said, take my yoke. It's easy. And my burden is light. So why are we telling people something contrary to what Jesus told people? Because the devil works the same way nowadays as he did in Genesis chapter three when he said, did God really say that? No, he didn't really say that. He's just trying to hold out on you. He just knows that the day you eat from it, you'll be like him knowing good and evil. Guess what? They already were like him. God already made Adam and Eve in his image. Genesis 1 26. And they said, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They already were like God. I know you guys, some of you are looking at me like, OK, broken record, pastor. Can you say that one more time? I've heard you a million times. But you know what? It's got to penetrate you yes. that there is something that happened there that as long as they were believing what God said about the garden, they had pleasure and what God said about the trees, they had pleasure and what God said about them, they felt pleasure, joy, happiness. Happiness. As long as they believed what God said, they had happiness and joy and peace. But the moment that they let the devil interrupt that stream of pleasure with this lie, you shall not die. God's just doing that to keep you from something good when God really gave them something good and said it was very good. It was so good that that's what Satan was so jealous of that he couldn't experience that because of his rebellion. So he's trying to bring man into that same bondage and he's trying to imprison man with misery, condemnation, guilt and shame. And that's what religion does. I wonder how many churches you could visit today. And a preacher will be shame, will be shaming someone. Well, you know, if you don't stop doing that, God's going to get you. God's going to, you know, it's going to catch up to you. God's going to judge you. You better get that right. You better not take communion with sin in your life or, or it's going to kill you. This is why many sleep and they misquote the Bible. Don't take communion unless you fixed everything in your life. Hey, that's why I'm taking communion, because I can't fix everything in my life. I'm taking communion because I'm going, thank you, Jesus, for your blood. You see, this is what this is what Jesus came to interrupt. He came to interrupt what the devil interrupted. He the devil interrupted pleasure. And Jesus came to interrupt the devil from interrupting the pleasure that God intended for us to have. That's why he says, I bring you good news of great joy. 
Great joy comes from good news. Great joy comes from good news. So we've got to decide what we're going to let into our ears next year, what we're going to let into our heart next year, what we're going to let into our eyes next year, what we're going to let roll around in our thinking next year. Because let me tell you something, the more good news you hear, the greater joy you'll have. The more bad news you focus on, the more misery you'll have. The more you feel like a failure and think about how you've done all these wrong things, you'll feel it'll create a stream of negative emotion and misery. The more you focus on what Jesus did, it'll create a stream of positivity and happiness and pleasure and joy, joy and pleasure and happiness are God's idea. Well, the Bible does say sin is pleasurable for a season. So sin must be so pleasure must be bad. No, sin is bad, but pleasure is not. The Bible does exactly say that sin is pleasurable for a season. In other words, it's short lived. Sin will only bring pleasure temporarily. That's why God is against it. He has something better than temporary pleasure. Oh, if you could get a hold of this in Ephesians chapter five, verse 18 and 19, Paul says, do not be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but rather be filled with the Holy Spirit. And for years, Christians have attributed their holiness. I thought this, too, the, that we've all been caught up with religious beliefs that aren't even biblically biblical beliefs. They're they're taken from the Bible out of context. So if you if you look at that verse, most people look at that verse as verse as do not be drunk with wine but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So wine must be bad and the Holy Spirit must be good. That's how people interpret that. You know, wine is bad. Holy Ghost, good. That's half right. Holy Ghost, good. Mm. Me say Holy Ghost, good. Uh, (laughs) But he's not Jesus, Paul, the apostle. They're not contrary. He's not contrasting something bad to something good, because if it's bad, then the Holy Spirit doesn't have to be much to be a little better than bad. But he's not contrasting something bad with something good when he says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's comparing something good with something better. He's saying wine intoxicates you and makes you feel happy, but the Holy Spirit will make you feel happier. Wine makes you forget your problems for a little while, which is good to forget your problems, but it's short lived. It only lasts for a while. You're intoxicated. Uh, You see, people aren't people aren't people aren't going and doing drugs and getting drunk for, for the wrong reason. Well, as long as you have the right reason, you know, take as much meth as you want. No, it's not. There's one reason people do drugs. There's one reason that people will drink to excess is because the promise of temporary happiness. It's not. Oh, I'm so bad. I thought that I used to think that about myself. Oh, I was addicted to these things as a young man. And I thought, oh, it's because I was such a sinner, which I was. But Um, So stopping all those bad things is God's plan for my life to stop all those bad things so I can start doing good things. And and that's the wrong way of looking at it. I was the Lord made it clear to me as I'm studying the Bible. Those things, though they were bad, I was doing them to be happy, but it only gives a temporary happiness and has negative side effects later. But the gospel, the love of God, the goodness of God, the Holy Spirit, the good news brings eternal happiness, long term satisfaction without any side effects, without a hangover, without getting in your blood and making you run into things while you're driving and driving drunk. I know I sound like I'm preaching drunk, but I'm just trying to tell you that's because I got something better. When he says in Song of Solomon, Solomon says the, the, the bride says to the groom and the groom says to the bride, your love is better than wine. Well, if wine is bad, then we, we can't even realize how what the person's love is like. If the love is better than wine, if love is better than wine, then it doesn't have to be very good since wine is so sinful, since alcohol is so sinful. Love doesn't have to be much to be better than that. And that's not what he's saying. 
He's saying wine is a celebrate is a celebra- celebratory symbol. It's a symbol of peace and joy and celebration and a, a toast and bring the bring the best robe and put it on my son. And he's, he's not comparing something bad to something good. I know I said that about the other scripture, but we got to look at the verses right. We got to look at the Bible correctly, comparing something good to something better. That's how good God's love is. That's how good the Holy Spirit is. He's saying it's better because it's not temporary. They both achieve the same thing. They make you happy, but one leaves you sad later and one just gets better and 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 better. And And there are no side effects. Oh, yeah. The side effects to love. It makes you happy. The side effects to love. The side effects of the Holy Spirit gives you a prayer language. The side effects of the Holy Spirit. He makes you smarter. Side effects of the Holy Spirit makes you realize all the good that God has done for you. Well, those are some good side effects of the Holy Spirit. So the shepherds hear the good news and it produces great joy. Then Zacharias, here's the good news in 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 Luke, chapter one, verse 14, which records the angel Gabriel telling Zacharias that he would have a son in his old age through Elizabeth. And he says in verse 14, you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. Notice Jesus birth produces joy and gladness. The good news about Jesus produces joy and gladness. And then in Luke one, verse forty six, Mary says, my soul exalts the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior. The word for rejoice here in verse forty seven is is this word. It means a state of great joy and gladness. It means a state of great joy and gladness. Her exaltation and great rejoicing of her soul is caused by what God has done for her. Her joy and her gladness is the result of what God has done for her. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior. He chose me and he picked me and he loves me and he's going to use me and he's going to save me through the son that I give birth to. That's that's what made her happy and rejoicing. We sometimes we see these words like as if she rejoiced for a second and then went back to her old way. No, she lived in the state of joy, in the state of happiness. Right. Because happiness is not a state of affairs. It's a state of mind. It comes from the way the way we think about what God has done for us. If you think God has been a miser towards you, you'll be a miser. If you think God has been generous towards you, you'll be generous. If you think God's happy with you, you'll be happy. God's happy with me. I'm telling you right now, God is not happy with me because I do everything right. God is happy with me because I believe in the blood no matter what. No matter what. He's like, yeah, I'm proud of you for trusting me. Not proud of you for being a performer and being holy enough. No, I'm proud of you because you believe in me. You take me at my word. You trust me. That makes God happy. You want to make him happy? Just believe him. Just trust him. You can't do anything to add to what God has done for you through Jesus. You can't do anything to add to it. You can't do anything to add to it. I, this thought came to me at the earlier service. I'll share it with you. Is it just reminded me of like if you get invited to a party or you get invited to a gathering, a family gathering or friends gathering for an event and you they, they invite you and you call them and say, oh, yeah, I'd love to come. And, and then you say, what, what can I bring? What can I bring? And you know what? A host oftentimes will say, don't bring anything. Just bring yourself. Hey, you don't have to tell me that twice. I'm telling you right now, if you invite me and say, don't bring anything but yourself, I am bringing myself. You ain't going to see anything in my hands. 
I'm not bringing you a bottle of wine. I'm not bringing you any bread. I'm not bringing you any candy. You said come. I take you at your word. You said just bring yourself. So I'm just bringing myself and sit myself in that party and enjoy it and not feel guilt about it. Not for one second, because you told me I don't have to bring anything but myself. Hey, 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 this is what the gospel is. You always like we're like, God, what can we bring? Jesus says you don't have to bring anything. I've made the food. I prepared the table. I prepared a mansion for you in heaven. Just bring yourself. Just bring yourself. You don't owe anything. I don't want any. Hey, Jesus is like, don't bring me that fruitcake now. Don't you dare. (laughs) This is the gospel. We don't bring anything to the table except ourself. God's like, you can. I got it all prepared. Don't bring anything. You just bring yourself. All that's left for us to do is just accept the invitation and say thank you. Thank you. That's the gospel. Just bring yourself. That brings good. Oh, really? But what does our culture do? You should feel guilty. I told you not to bring something, but that was code for bring something. (laughs) Sounds like somebody's married. Hey, (laughs) you see, the devil's a liar telling you, you got to bring your holiness. You better fix this. You better check that. And God's like, just bring yourself. I got it. I got the table prepared. Kill the fatted calf. Bring the best robe, put a ring on his finger. Oh, he doesn't deserve that. Exactly. He was lost, but now he's been found. He was dead and now he's alive. That's the gospel. How about the Magi? They come in Matthew chapter two and a star, verse nine and ten. When they'd seen in the east went out went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. So we have the shepherds rejoicing. So you guys that are watching this on TV, say, oh, this must be Christmas. No, we're not. It's not Christmas. This is the gospel. This is what I've learned about Christmas, though. There, have you ever thought like every Christmas, man, I feel like such peace. Calm. All is calm and all is bright. You think about that every Christmas, we all feel it. There's something in the air. It's like a peace and there's this joy and there's this sense of rest and calm. And and it's like, why? It's because there are so many people. Focused on Jesus that it completely changes the atmosphere in the world for a day. And what we and what we have been given is that we have the power to change our atmosphere every day based on what our mind is fixed on. The mind that is fixed on him, Isaiah 26, three says, God will keep you in perfect peace when your mind is fixed on him. No wonder we have peace. And you think it's because of the holiday. You think it's because people are off work, but not everybody's off work. But why is there joy and why is there kindness and generosity and 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 all this is it's because we are all focused, even if we don't, even if we're not even a Christian, everybody knows Christmas is about Jesus. Everybody knows it's Jesus birth. Everybody knows it's Christmas is Jesus. And when your mind is fixed on Jesus coming to the earth, Emmanuel, God with us. Peace flows. We don't have to limit it to Christmas. Christmas is proof that when people are focused on one thing about what Jesus has come to do for them, they have joy and they have peace. So you know what? I can think that today, tomorrow I can focus on that next. Maybe maybe the whole world isn't going to be focused on it, but I'm responsible for my world. You're responsible for your world. Does that make sense? It's just. Wow. 
What were they all so happy about? They were happy about one thing. God with us. Matthew 1, 23, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, for he is God with us. So everybody got joy when they realized God was with them. Everybody has joy. And everybody has peace when they realize God is with them. But what does religion tell us? Religion tells us, you know what? God isn't with you anymore because you sin. You're going to have to earn him back. You're going to have to get the sin out of your life. So he comes back. No, he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So guess what? I feel because of that joy that God is with me. He's with me all the time. So guess what? I can feel any time I want joy and peace, happiness because God's with me, because what happened in the garden is that man and Adam and Eve had pleasure and they had happiness until what? Until they believed a lie. And then what happened? They lost their happiness. But why did they lose their happiness? Because their sin separated them from God's presence. And there's nothing more miserable than life without God. And life without God created sorrow. The first emotion that came into the world was fear and sorrow and depression and then anger in Genesis chapter four. All these emotions came because man had separated himself from God by believing a lie. So this is why God made his presence available to people throughout the Bible. He comes in the form of the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. That's the ark of God's presence. And wherever God's presence was, I don't have time to get into the teaching of this. But in Second Samuel, chapter six, the, David and his men are carrying the Ark of the Covenant to, to, the, to David's home. The Ark of the Covenant is the is where God's presence would dwell in the temple. God would dwell in the in the Ark of the Covenant. It was like a, a wooden box with gold and, and all sorts of and the cherubim and the seraphim, the angels on this this piece of furniture called the Ark of the Covenant. God dwelt in there, not in the outer courts, not in the inner courts, but in the Holy of Holies. That's where God's presence was. And so when they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, wherever they were, wherever they went, they were dancing and singing and celebrating. Why? Because they were carrying the presence of God. But then somebody touched it that wasn't a priest because only priests could touch the ark. Guess what? God has made us kings and priests. We get to touch God's presence. In fact, he lives in us now. So as soon as he touched it, the, the it wobbled, the Ark of the Covenant wobbled and that man died. And they said, "Whoa, we better stop right now. And they were and they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. You can find this in Second Samuel six. And they said, we got to stop. David said, we got to stop. Let's leave it here at the house of Obed Edom. And the Bible says when they left the Ark of the Covenant in the house of Obed Edom, everything in Obed Edom's house was happy and blessed and joyful and fortunate and to be envied. And it was everything that everybody wants and every bit of happiness that anybody could ever ask for. It was in his house as long as the Ark of the Covenant was in there. And so David realized, whoa, they're having so much joy and peace and blessedness and happiness. I think we're ready to take it back to my house. So he takes the he takes a, he gets his guys. He's like, no, nobody mess this up. Nobody, nobody fudge this up. He said, come on, let's carry this to my house, man. It's too good. It's too good to leave it there. We got to get it to my house. They take it to his house. And as they take it, they start singing and dancing again and rejoicing and praising. Why? Because the presence of God brings joy. No wonder. Psalm 1611 says in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So guess what? So where is the Ark of the Covenant now? The Bible says the Ark of the Covenant is inside of us. We are now the temple of the living God and the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And so we are now the Ark of the Covenant. Every human person who has invited Jesus into their life is the Ark of the Covenant. Now you're carrying the presence of God. So guess what? Now that you realize you're carrying the presence of God, if you really believe that it'll make you dance, it'll make you shout, it'll make you praise, it'll make you sing, it'll make you happy. It will bring pleasure. Why? Because God is with us. Because God is with us. In us. And for us. 
And when you believe that, everything is going to be all right. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, the devil is a liar. God is with you and he's never going to leave. When you believe that peace and joy is going to flood your life and flood your soul. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for your grace. Lord, I just pray that this would sink deep in our hearts. Every one of us would find a awaken to the presence of God, that we would awaken to the fact that by the blood of Jesus, you've come to live inside of us and we are ever living in your presence and your presence is ever living in us. I pray for a revelation of that to come upon every person within the sound of my voice in whatever means or way they're hearing this. And with every head bowed, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, as your savior and Lord, I want to pray with you and I'm just going to invite you to pray along with me out loud and I'm going to invite everybody to please pray with us. But if you'd like to receive Jesus as your savior and Lord, you've never been born again. You've never accepted him as your savior and Lord. Now is a great time to do it. Why put it off? Jesus paid the price for you. He died for you. We got to realize that it was for you. You got to realize it was for you. So I invite you to pray with me if you'd like to for the first time. Everybody's going to pray with us. Just say this, Heavenly Father. I invite Jesus Christ into my life as my Savior and Lord. I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. The blood of Jesus cleanses me from all my sin. From this moment forward, I'm a child of God with every head bowed. If you prayed that prayer to receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I'm going to count to three. And on the count of three, I'm going to ask that you lift up your hand. If you prayed that prayer, I meant it on the count of three. One, two, three, right where you're right where you see. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you here. God bless you here. God bless you here. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I see you in the back. God bless you here. God bless you here. Who else? Keep your hand up. God bless you here. Who else? God bless you here. God bless you here. Come on. Let's really thank God for all these people. God bless you right here. Hey, wow. All up in the center and everywhere else. I, hey, if we didn't Hopefully somebody saw you. one of our team members saw you because we're trying to give you this book. If you had your hand up, it's called The Power of a New Life. And if you're watching online, we'll send this to you as our gift to you for absolutely free. If you let us know that you prayed to receive Jesus today as your Savior and Lord. And if for some reason you raise your hand, but one of our team members wasn't able to spot you, sometimes I can see you better than anybody on the ground can. Uh, pardon us if we didn't see you, but if you let one of our team members know, hey, that was me, they'll give you one of these if for some reason they didn't catch you when your hand was up. So congratulations. You just made the greatest decision of your life. You'll never regret it. I'm telling you, you will never, ever regret it. All you got to do is bring yourself. Just bring yourself. What do, what do I got to bring? Bring yourself There's a party going on here now. It's a celebration. Christianity is a celebration. It's a party. People, I know people say, no, 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 it's, it's suffering and it's you no. Know, Jesus did the suffering so that we could do the celebrating. And I'm not going to let his the, his blood go unnoticed and uncelebrated since he did that for you and he did that for me. Amen. Hey, before we leave our final Sunday of the year, check out a quick update of what your gifts have done in our harvest fund. 2018, we've reached over 2.8 million people, approximately 2.7, 2.8 million people that either have gotten saved or their life has been impacted, engaged with us in a way that they hadn't done before. And we just put a two minute video together to show you what our harvest fund is doing. And um, and we received a, a matching gift of fifty thousand dollars. That means anybody that gives before the end of the year, whatever you give to our harvest fund is worth double whatever it is. So if you give one hundred dollars, it's matched with another hundred up to fifty thousand. And so um, check out what your seed has done and then we'll just give you an opportunity to give as quick as we can. So thank you. Check it out.
Come on, team. Come on, team. Hey, come on, let's thank God. You know, these are just some of the things that we've been, come on, team, come on, team. Give people an opportunity to give, come on. Um, and these are many of the people that have been touched and reached by you through your giving. And that's just the people we have recorded. Like we don't even have all the hundreds and thousands of people that have gotten saved on the streets, gotten saved through um, through our outreaches, our missions. Uh, they're just we're, we're you're winning souls. Believe me, you're winning souls. And this is just what we have recorded. And there's so much more. We just don't want to exaggerate. That's why we want to be true to the numbers that we have. But uh, as you know, so many people pray silently that for Jesus to come into their life, so many people come and receive healing and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they find their place in Christ by the teaching that happens here in this church. And so you're making a difference. And I want to invite you to make a difference for the following year, because in 2020, even though we reached two point seven million, our goal is thirteen point eight million because we've studied and researched and we have thought, what can we do if people give and people do what we did last year and then we multiply what we did with all the different ways that we're going to use to minister to people. We're going to reach 13.8 million. So would you make the best gift you can before we leave? And those of you that are watching us online, make the best gift that you can in our harvest fund. Um, so we reached 2.7 million in the last 12 months. We're going to reach 13.8 million people in the next 12 months. We're believing God for uh, uh, everybody to give as generously as they can. So you can text to give. You can text LCIC and then the amount and then MG, which is matching gift. Or you can text any of those letters. It'll all get there. So uh, just make sure it's to LCIC and then the amount. Um, so your gift will be doubled today because of the matching gift that's been offered. And really, maybe maybe God will move on your heart to say, I want to I want to offer a matching gift like I'd like to pledge this amount if people will match it. If God moves on your heart, if you have a business or you have received some, you know, saved money or have some sort of um, gift, charitable gift that you want to make and you want it to be a matching gift, contact our accounting department, contact somebody at our church and let them know. And um, and you can inspire others with your generosity, just as this anonymous donor has done. <laughs> so thank you in advance for whatever amount you can give. It's making a difference. And we want to come back here same time next year and see that video be 10 times as many people that reached as a result of our giving and as a result of the gospel. Amen. Come on. Thank God. So do your best. Do your best today. And um, and everybody just uh, hold your phone or your, however you're giving. And let's pray together. Say thank you, Jesus, that I've been invited to the table and I don't have to bring a thing except myself. But when I give today, more souls are going to bring themselves to Jesus. And I believe that we will reach over 13 million people in the next 12 months. Use my seed and multiply it back so that I have more to give so we can reach more souls in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you. Come on. Give the Lord a hand. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for taking a moment. Come on, let's really thank God. I'm telling you, man, we're a part of something special. We're a part of something special, and I'm honored that you um, that you're a part of it with me and that I'm honored to be a part of it myself. So thank you. And um, as our team receives the offering, we're going to stand together and we're going to be dismissed. So um, just if it's already been passed, go ahead and, and stand. And I just want to encourage you to take this joy and this happiness with you. Take it home. Why? Because good news produces great joy. And let's commit ourselves to focusing on the good news of what Jesus has done for us. And it will constantly produce a stream of continual happiness, joy and peace all year round. God bless you all. Thanks for coming this last Sunday of the year. Uh, Tuesday night is our New Year's Eve service. We will not have service on Wednesday because it's January 1st. But Tuesday night, we're going to have 930 p.m. service past my bedtime. But I decided I'm going to come anyway. So join me at 930 Tuesday night for New Year's Eve celebration. God bless everybody. If you need prayer for anything else, please come to the altar. One of our prayer partners will pray for you. Love you guys. Thanks for being here today.